I've heard from Brother Gross and appreciate the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord again tonight and to see all of our visitors and to see the ministering brethren here tonight. That is exciting to me. Praise the Lord. You feel the Holy Ghost? I feel His presence here right now. That's what makes it worthwhile being here. One more time, I'd ask you to lift your hands and just wave to the Lord. Feel after the presence of the Lord. Jesus, thank You for Your Spirit. Thank You for Your power. Thank You for Your glory. Keep Your hand upon each and every one of us tonight. Minister and meet needs in this place. Praise the name of the Lord. I appreciate a meeting of this nature. I appreciate the caliber of men that I'm in the presence of tonight. Preachers that have held on to the word of the Lord. It's not every camp meeting and not every pulpit that you can go to and truly know it's open. So much political agenda has entered into the church today. Preach Calvary. Preach love, you know, instead of just preach the Word. I love all of this book. Praise God. And I know you do too. And above all else, I want to be saved tonight. Boy, we're down to the where the rubber meets the road, aren't we? Living in a real live genuine cesspool called society. And I don't want to forget that the Lord's coming. I want to preach to you from my heart tonight. I, I really thank God that I feel what I feel in my heart tonight. You know, there's, there can be pressure that goes with meetings. And, but when the Holy Ghost prevails, the pressure leaves and you just feel a comfortable feeling that God's got His hand on you. and Just preach what God wants you to preach and everything's going to be all right. That's the way I think. That's the way I believe it. I want to say thank you to Brother and Sister Spell for allowing us to be in their home. And I want to thank all of you that participated in that offering tonight. And from the bottom of my heart, my wife and I say thank you very much. There's about 28 or 30 people in Greeley, Colorado that say thank you. And I appreciate you very, very much tonight. Remember us in your prayers. We just want to do something for the Lord there. I, uh, I'm glad I'm where I'm at. I don't have to fight what a lot of you preachers have to fight. You're tempted to compromise to keep up with the compromiser down the road. You know, there's so much compromising going on because of numbers. Preachers are playing number games. And if the saints, if you preach it strong, then there's a church right down the way that preacher, he ain't got a backbone and he's a compromising idiot. And he'll just take them in with their TV and their makeup and their jewelry. And you're tempted with that. There's not a church within 20, 30 miles of me. Praise God. And not only that, but they don't know anything else but what I preach and teach. Man, I'm going to tell you right now, they take their jewelry off when they pray through at my church. Do you know why? Now, I'm, not, I'm not saying that to get you to clap your hand, but I'm going to tell you, because I show them in the Word of the Lord. And they just got the Holy Ghost, the Catholic Church didn't teach them anything about that. And when they get a genuine experience in the Holy Ghost, and you show them the word of the Lord, well, they receive not the wearing of gold or pearls, just like they receive. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus. It's all the book. I thank God for that. And, you know, I've had people to, uh, and I preached revivals all around the country, and I've, had, I've gone to churches where I preached a revival, and then I went back to another church about 10 or 15 miles away, and I saw 15 or 20 or 30 or 40 saints from the church I preached 15 miles away back at that church. 
I'll tell you, you talk about scrambling through notes. And I'm going to tell you, this church hopping is going to send a bunch of people to hell. And it's going to send a bunch of preachers to hell too. Well, praise God. You can't say that at a lot of camp meetings either. Thank God for an open pulpit. I'm going to preach this gospel wherever they want to hear it. I'm reading tonight from a verse of Scripture in the found in the 24th chapter of the book of Acts. You know what I forgot? Brother Holland, would you come up here tonight? Bring, get a Bible and come up here. I meant to get someone to read for me tonight, and you're the perfect one. Praise God. That's my Colorado bow hunting buddy right there. I won't go into any more detail than that, Brother Holland. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise God. I'm reading from the book of Acts tonight, chapter number 24, and then I would like to read from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. My, my, my. We feeling the Holy Ghost here tonight? I am. Now, I'm going to tell you, there may not be a lot of hooping and hollering going on right now, but what's that anyway? God told Elijah about a still, small voice one day. It ain't always in the shout. We may shout before it's over with. Praise the Lord, but I'll tell you one thing. God's in this place. I'll challenge anybody to deny that. God's in this place. And I want to be saved. And I believe there's a bunch of people in this building that want to be saved. And I believe the impact of this service tonight, not because I'm preaching, but because what God's going to do to your heart is going to go home with you. It's going to work in your home and your family and your city. Book of Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 and 2. Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing some of the things, believing all the things, all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein, or in the fact that there will be a resurrection, that John the Revelator said, I saw the small and the great stand before God. And the sea gave up the dead. I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And if you really believe that, well, Paul said, in that fact, I exercise myself. To have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Praise God. I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, But by manifestation 
of the truth. You know what that means? Just telling the truth. Just preaching the truth. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul was not appealing to an organizational structure. Paul was not appealing to a religious structure. Paul's appeal with his ministry was not appealing to carnal minds of humanistic ideologies or education. Paul's appeal was to the conscience of mankind. I want to preach to you tonight for the next little while on this thought. Living within the realm of your conscience. Young person, mom and dad, saint of God, preacher. That's a realm that I'll challenge you and God certainly is challenging all of us, myself included. Not to live in the realm of what someone else thinks. Not to live in the realm of someone else's ideas. But to live in the realm of your conscience. Paul never appealed to anything else. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience. Praise God. Living within the realm. Of your conscience. Appreciate this audience tonight. For loving the word of the Lord enough. Stay with me last night. And hear the word of God. I'm asking you once again. I need your help. Because I'm not a preacher. Only, only God is the preacher. And I need your help. Would you beseech the Lord for me. On my behalf. To anoint me. But to anoint your hearing. and Your ability to understand God's word. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for Your Spirit. Lord, I'm asking You to help me to be a blessing to Your kingdom. I know that the, the hour is upon us. The closing of time. The coming of the Lord is upon us. I'm asking You to help us to prepare our hearts. I know that there are many people in the last day that have turned away. The love of God in their heart has become lukewarm and cold. It's wax cold. But God, I also know that there's got to be a people that want to be saved enough to live according to Your Word. That will love Your Word and obey their conscience. In Jesus' name, keep Your hand on us tonight and we pray. Everybody say Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. God bless you. Appreciate you standing with me for the reading of the word of the Lord. Praise God. The conscience. The word conscience in our Greek, in the Greek tonight in our text, comes from a Greek word, sunadesis. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Brother Therese is here, and if he knows as much about Greek as his dad does, he'll know if I pronounced it right. Sunadesis, or a knowing. Everybody say a knowing. It is a co-knowledge with oneself. The faculty by which we apprehend the will of God. Co-perception. Co-perception. Comes from the word sunadu, which means to see completely. To see completely or to become aware. The conscience is a co-perception. Now it was David in the book of Psalms that said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Certainly the word of God is God's knowledge. Paul said in the book of 2 Corinthians, he said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself above the knowledge of God. 
This is his knowledge. But I want you to know tonight that the conscience, the word of God or this Bible that we hold is God's written law. But there is an inward, unwritten law that God has written upon the heart of man. That's why it's co-perception. It's, it works alongside of God's Word. And don't ever mistake for one minute that if you can't understand the Bible, you're without the law. God's taken care of that. Because you have a conscience. I'd like to show you tonight the conscience at work and at action. In the book of John, if you have your Bibles tonight, I'd like for you to turn there with me. The book of St. John, chapter number 8. The Bible tells us, The scribes and the Pharisees, verse 3, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst... They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that she should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Now can you imagine what's going on tonight? Here is humanity that has taken the written law, the, the mosaic law that God gave to man on Mount Sinai and all of the orders therein. And here is man taking this written law and they have caught this woman in the act of adultery and they're approaching the author of the law with the law. Here they are approaching the author of the law as if they had totally got this thing down pat. I mean, they are expertise at the word and the law of God and they figured it all out and they know just what it means. So they're going towards God and they're saying, Now, Lord, this is what the word says. Hey, friend, for you folks ever come around, the one you're talking to tonight made that word. So it was quite evident to the Lord that these people learned how to hold the law and twist it and distort it and pervert it. They learned how to quote it. They learned how to preach it. And yet they really never grasped the full meaning of what it said. I have no monitors up here at all. So if I'm too loud out there, praise God, I'm sorry. But I need some monitors. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now. Here they are, quoting the law to the author of the law. Don't you think for one minute there's not people around today that have learned to take this law and take religion and even take what our doctrine believes and yet in other areas of the law they have missed the whole point. They've missed the whole reality of what living for God is about. Amen. And they're, they're learning how to live with the law but yet they're not fulfilling it in their lives. And so Jesus didn't try to sit down and... and uh, and argue the issue with them. He didn't sit down and start some kind of debate. Rather than that, Jesus knew that it wasn't all put on paper. Jesus knew that there was another law. That he didn't ride on a table of stone. But he put it on the heart. And so Jesus just simply stooped down in the sand. As if to press a button to activate a video monitor. Amen. In their mind and in their heart. And all of a sudden somewhere way down deep inside side of them was a monitor that began one by one to point out the inconsistencies of their life and the sins of their life and the Bible said they being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one don't you ever think for one second, friend, that God left us without some understanding beyond the Scriptures? Amen. Don't you ever think for one minute, hey, there's people that say, it's just the way you interpret it. I'm going to tell you, your conscience knows how to interpret right from wrong. Amen. Well, no. 
Nobody preaches everything the same way. Hey, I'm going to tell you, where the Word is silent, God put a conscience there. And I'm going to tell you, if you're expecting a preacher to give everything about what kind of car you got to drive and how long your sleeve's got to be, hey, there's a conscience inside of you that God ordained to work and we need to live within the realm of that conscience. I'm going to tell you why there's so much church hopping today. Because saints don't want to pray and listen to their conscience. They want to find some preacher to point out everything they got to do and they ain't got to do. Hey friend, why don't you grow up and learn how to pray and live for God and be a child of the Lord? Praise God. Hallelujah. Now y'all don't get noisy tonight. You just sit there and behave. Praise God. I'm going to tell you something. It's a, it's a very dangerous thing to have a knowing. It's a very dangerous thing to have a knowing. That's what the conscience is. It's a knowing. I'd like to direct you to Romans chapter number 1 tonight. And verse number 17, Paul said in 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation. In verse 17, he said, For therein, for in this gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And then in verse 18, he says, For the wrath of God, everybody say, The wrath of God, wrath of God. is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Why in the world would God's wrath be revealed from heaven against men that hold the truth in unrighteousness? Someone said, God is love, 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 love. That's all God knows is love, love, love. You're right. He loves, he loves his word. Amen. And he loves us enough to stand behind his word. And I'm going to tell you something. Amen. At the end of the day, he'd hired some at the first hour and the third hour and the sixth hour and the ninth hour. And he gave them all the same reward. You know what it was? Eternal life. Praise God. Amen. And if you think God's going to change his message to save your soul, you're crazy. God's got a word. And we're going to live by it. And if you don't want to live by it, you're not going to get the reward. You can't change the word of God to save your soul. God's got a word and you're going to have to live by his word. Everybody over here say amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Because that which may be known of God Why is God getting so mad? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. Maybe you have forgotten the privilege, amen, that you've had appointed to you to be able to come out of a filthy, corrupt world where there's nothing but liars. I said liars. And they're in every kind of denomination. And they'll tell you anything you want to hear. But thank God we're privileged to come into the house of God where a God called man will tell us what the truth is and put in our hands not some scatterbrained idea out of Salt Lake City but the infallible word of God that was delivered as holy men of old were moved on by the Holy Ghost in your hands tonight is the word of God that which we have seen that which we have handled that which we have tasted the good word Word of God. Some of you are about as excited about this good word of God tonight as you would be sitting watching two ants carry off a piece of bread. But I'm going to tell you something. The day you begin to love God's word is be the day you're a child of God. 
the day you got something interested, amen, in the, what the preacher's going to preach, that's going to be the day when you're going to be not just a pew warmer, you're going to be a powerhouse for God. Because you want to hear what the word of the Lord has to say. The Bible said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the church. I want to know who's got ears to hear tonight. Who's got ears to hear? Can you get your head out of the sand? Can you pull yourself away from the world enough to hear what the word of the Lord has to say? Are you so caught up in the professionalism? Are you so caught up in this world that the preaching can't touch you? What caused God to be upset was the fact that that which might be known of God had been revealed unto them. Now I'm going to tell you, the conscience is the knowledge of God. The conscience is what you have that tells you what is right and what is wrong. And I'm going to tell you, if you got any brains at all in this hour, you're going to protect your conscience. You're going to listen to your conscience. You're going to get your eyes off that backslid saint sitting over yonder. You're going to get your eyes off of that backslide of the smoking dope. You're going to hear what your conscience has to say. Because your conscience has given you the knowledge of God. God's trying to relate to our conscience. We need to wake up and hear what the Holy Ghost is trying to tell us. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to wake up around here tonight. We are going to wake up around here. Amen. Sooner or later, we're going to wake up around here. Romans chapter 2 and verse number 14. Listen to this. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Wait a minute. You know what that's saying? That's saying that everybody don't have this book. Someone said, well, God can't come back until every African's heard this message. Till every native somewhere off in some tribe way back in the jungle has had a search for truth Bible study. Jesus can't come. I'm going to tell you something. The Bible said Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. And I'm going to tell you, friend, he's got ways of dealing with people. Amen. Beside this book, you hear me? When the Gentiles that have not the law do by nature or natural function, amen, do by their own uh, actions, the things that are contained in the law. There are people that don't know anything about a woman's hair. But I want you to know before my wife ever got the Holy Ghost, before her parents ever knew anything, they said you're not cutting your hair hey back it was just a thing that they didn't do that's your glory and they didn't know it was God's glory they didn't know anything about the scripture there's a lot of people in this world today that don't know anything about the scriptures that'll say that ain't right and we're not gonna do it amen it ain't right to be a queer it ain't right for a man to stroll down the street with another man it ain't right for a woman to love another woman and it ain't right for the things that's going on it just ain't right to happen they don't know anything about the bible but thank god there's a conscience that's telling them it ain't right it ain't right it ain't right and the bible said when they do not have the law they have become a law unto themselves which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. And you hear me tonight. The preachers are preaching, but he ain't got a name everything he can think of tonight because there's a conscience in you that already told you before you got here the way you've been living ain't right. Just the holy atmosphere of God around this tabernacle has been convicting people about the way they're living and you can justify it all you want to but that ain't going to change the unwritten law of God that's upon your heart. St. 
Satan came in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. The serpent, more subtle than any beast of the field, said to the woman, Hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? He was warning of this. The next thing you know in verse 7, after they've defied the, the ordinance of God, the next thing you know, verse 7, the eyes of them both were opened. And they heard the voice of God. He came walking in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. Do you know what you're witnessing here? You are seeing the conscience activated for the very first time. Now I want to show you how pure and how powerful the conscience is. When they sinned against God and they heard the voice of the Lord, the first thing they did, Brother Burgess, was ran and hid themselves because they had a guilty conscience. They had a healthy conscience. But you follow man in the scriptures and you see something scary taking place, Brother Holland. You know what you see? You see man... He's quit running. And now, God's knocking on Cain's door. And he's saying, where is Abel thy brother? And instead of saying, I've sinned. The devil got a hold of me and I did something I shouldn't have done. He passed the buck and said, Am I my brother's keeper? In other words, I don't want to answer the cry of my conscience. I want to just bypass what my conscience is saying and justify my actions. And I want to show you what led a world to a place just a few chapters later. The Bible said every imagination of the thoughts of their heart was only, was only, was only evil continually. I want to show you what brings people to a place in their life where they are reprobate and they can't think one good thought. You know what causes that? They refusing to answer the cry of their conscience they justify every act and every deed you hear me tonight if you hear your conscience crying and you justify your actions and you refuse to answer the cry of your conscience and do something about it it won't be long before your conscience will be seared and defiled and you won't even be hearing it anymore and you'll become reprobate I don't know how rotten this world could have been for God to say, I can't redeem it. All I can do is start over. The Bible says as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. The Bible said the earth had corrupted itself. Corrupted. Ruined. Decayed. Corrupted. Ruined. Decayed. It was spoiled. It had reached a place that it had become irreversible. I said it had reached a place where it had become irreversible. Oh, I ain't going to that tabernacle tonight. I don't want to hear that preacher preach to me. That's how crazy you are. That's how foolish you are. I'm going to tell you, your only link to heaven tonight is a preacher that will activate your conscience. Your only link to heaven tonight is a man of God that will challenge your conscience to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say. 
and it won't be long young person when the conscience is crying inside and you refuse to do anything about it it won't be long where you'll be able to smoke dope and run off with some girl in the night amen it won't be long you'll be able to sell your soul and never hear the voice of your conscience never do anything about it Adam and Eve. Eve said, or Adam said, she gave it to me. Eve said, the devil made me do it. Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? You want to follow the road to reprobate mine? Just follow self-justified sinning. Everybody else is doing it. I know when I reached up and put those scissors in my hair, it was wrong because everything inside of me said it's wrong. But everybody else is doing it. Who cares what everybody else is doing? Everybody else may be going to hell. Oh, you can't say amen tonight because you're cutting your hair. You can't get behind preaching like this because you got a guilty conscience. And then we've got evangelists preaching. If our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. You know what that means? That means if your heart, as wicked and sinful as it is, condemns you, God's even greater than that because He's holier than that. That don't mean if our hearts condemn us, we're supposed to try to have peace. Because the very next verse that He left out said if our heart condemn us not, then we do have peace with God. I'm going to tell you, we're in trouble. We're in trouble when preachers say, I refuse to preach anything that brings condemnation on my people. We've reached a sad day in Pentecost when we say, I'm not going to preach anything that makes my people feel guilty. My God, you idiot, get out of the pulpit and let a man of God take your place. If you preach this Bible, it's going to go against the flesh every time. Are you trying to get somebody to heaven? Or are you trying to make a bunch of reprobates? I will tell you, I thank God for every preacher that got me under my pew. We've been in praying and crying. I thank God for every preacher that stood like a man and preached the Word of God and caused me to pray through. So God says, I got to get a hold of this. God says, I've got to bring man back into line with my will. So he calls Moses up to Sinai. And he says, here Moses. Love the Lord thy God with all thy soul and thy mind and thy strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. What are you trying to do, God? I'm trying to purge your conscience. I'm trying to activate something inside of you.
But there was a problem with that. Because God took this perfect word and this perfect law, this first covenant, and he put it in the hands of an imperfect humanity and said, live it. Well, you've got to understand, man was all haywire anyway because his conscience was already defiled. So man would take his laws and his ordinances and go through the actions of sacrifices, walk in there, the high priest walked in there with his pomegranate uh, shells on, rattling around, and, and uh, he'd come out and they said, whoopee, we got redemption for another year. Let's go worship Baal. Man, we spoke in tongues. We had church. Let's go listen to rock music. Let's go worship and dance to the beat of the world's drum. Let's gather around and watch a movie tonight. Let's gather around and, and, and listen to some ungodly rap music. Amen. And so, God said, this ain't going to work. You know why it couldn't work? Amen. Hebrews explains it real good. The Bible said in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9... That there was an, er, an earthly sanctuary, a worldly sanctuary, divine ordinances and service, which was a figure of the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Man could go through all the right moves and go through all the right ordinances and leave that sanctuary. But when he got home, his conscience was still guilty. He still had the filthy thoughts. Even though he went through the motions, his heart was messed up. His conscience was stained. It was guilty. And God said, I'm going to have to start this whole thing over. I'm going to have to start it all over. And so God said, I'm not going to write another law. I'm going to become the law. I'm going to become the Word made flesh. I'm going to settle it all. But my number one goal is not just to provide redemptive blood. That redemptive blood's the purpose, all right. But it's not just for me to hang on a cross. It's what that blood's going to do. I'm going to come down. And we're going to start this whole thing over. We're going to start it over clean. We're going to start it over right. I'm going to whitewash everything. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I'm going to purge your conscience. Hallelujah. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, of this building, neither by the blood of goats or cows, but by His own blood, He entered in once to the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God purge your conscience from dead works to serve to serve to serve the living God now I'm going to tell you I'm preaching up here and I see a whole lot of laughing and talking going on while I'm preaching and if I catch you doing it again I'm going to walk right back there and say don't talk you're talking right now. Come on, quit that talking. I'm preaching. Amen. And you're the one that's blabbing your mouth while I'm preaching. And the one next to you needs to get a purged conscience. You're laughing and talking about something going on outside this building. Well, the power of God's trying to do something in here for you. 
And the only reason why you're not interested in what I'm saying is because your conscience is all messed up and you don't even have enough fear of God to hear a preacher preach. And if you did have enough fear of God, you'd hear what the preacher had to say and you'd leave here on fire for God loving what the preacher's preaching. The reason why you can sit and carry on a conversation in the house of God is because God don't mean enough to you. But He means that much to me and you need to stop your talking. Hallelujah. My God, if I was a Holy Ghost young person and someone wanted to carry on a conversation while we're having camp meet, I'd say, shut your mouth till the service is over. Shut your mouth till the preacher's done preaching. I want to hear what that man's got to say. I need all the help I can get living in this world. He's God. I'm going to tell you, the Bible said he purged our conscience from dead works. So that we could serve the living God. We're trying to get people to serve God with a wicked conscience. We're trying to get people to serve God with a stained conscience. Come on everybody, lift your hands, lift your hands. Come on please, everybody, everybody lift your hands. Come on please, would you please lift your hands. Come on, worship the Lord, everybody please. Please would you get behind me? Please would you show that you love the Lord? Please everybody, would you please lift your hands? Would you please worship the Lord? Could we have church tonight? Could everybody worship? Could we all sing? Could we all stay? Could we all do the will of God? Please? Would you please worship? Would you please love the Lord? Would you please participate in camp meeting tonight? Would you please feel joy? Would you please feel good? Would you please feel right? Would you please feel the Holy Ghost? That ain't the way you do it. You got to preach against sin. You got to get it out of their heart. You got to preach repentance. You got to get them to an order. And when they get right, you ain't going to have to beg them to lift their hands. You ain't going to have to beg them to worship the Lord. You ain't going to have to beg them to have joy. young people too interested in dating here tonight to have church. If you're a Holy Ghost young person, you need to get your, you need to get your eyes. If you're going to find somebody, find somebody that loves to worship. Find somebody that's at the altar. And if you ever get married, they'll treat you right. And they'll treat your kids right. And they'll have a conscience. 
and they won't come home and beat you up and they won't go messing around and whoring around with someone else because they got a conscience that's sensitive to what the Holy Ghost is saying. If I was a young person here tonight, I'd find me someone on fire for God. I'm going to tell you, you're going to be in a mess if you get the wrong one. Patty cake now, please. See if you can patty cake just a little bit more for Jesus. See if you can, young person. I don't want to mess up your tie tonight. I don't want to mess up your hairdo. But I'm going to tell you, if you get what God has for you tonight, you ain't going to care about your hairdo. You ain't going to care about your tie. You're going to thank God you got the renewing you come for. You're going to thank God you got something that Ajax won't take off. You're going to thank God you got something in your heart. Hallelujah. He had to purge their conscience to serve. The living God. And I'm going to tell you, you ain't nothing but a pew warmer till you get your conscience right. You ain't nothing but dead weight to a church till you get your conscience right. As a matter of fact, the biggest hindrance we got here tonight is people that's trying to live for God with their conscience not right. What kills our services ain't sinners. It's so-called saints that come trashing their conscience and their guilt and their sin and their filth and their condemnation and they drag it through the house of God and we're trying to have church with adultery and homosexuality and a bunch of sinning going on. And that ain't going to get this gospel to our world. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, with a true heart, with a true heart. Come on, let's get our heart right. Let's get one thought in our mind tonight. Let's be sincere. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our Conscience, having our hearts sprinkled with, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Peter said it like this. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer... But the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. Well, Mark said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Well, our church don't believe you have to be baptized to be saved. Who cares what your church believes? We don't believe what churches believe. We believe what the Bible said. And the Bible said when you go down in Jesus' name, you get the answer of a clean conscience towards God.
that's the reason why the church world wears makeup, cuts their hair, messes around, smokes cigarette on the front porch, go to the movies, live ungodly, and their conscience don't bother them. I want you to know, this old hippie boy didn't even know how lost he was till he got the Holy Ghost. But I went and repented of my sins. I went down in the water in the name of Jesus. You know what happened to me? I didn't just get wet. For the first time in my life, I knew what it was like to be clean. I was Mr. Clean. I knew what it was like to hold my head up and say, God is my God. I'm on my way to heaven. I don't have to hang my head in shame. I don't have to hang my head in depression. I'm right with God. Got all my sins washed. I'm clean. I'm going to heaven. What you need is to start over again. You need to repent. You need to get your conscience right. You need to get to the place where you know what it's like to feel clean, to feel clean, to feel right. You know, Paul said, I believe there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And he said, herein do I exercise myself. How many know anything about exercise? How many want to start in the morning? But when the morning comes, you're ready to start in the morning again, ain't you? You know, you may be seated. You may be, you may be different, but everybody's going to go on a diet tomorrow. I'm going to need you here to read for me, Elder. Amen. Please, Lord. Paul said, herein do I exercise myself. I have to work on it. don't come easy. All right. It just, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work. It's exercise. It's a day-to-day affair with me. Uh-huh. I have to work on having a conscience that's void of offense. All right. All right. It just don't happen. I have to make it happen. And I'm going to tell you, this man's got all the qualifications to write what he wrote. Let's read some of his writings. Read for me. Please. This I say therefore and testify of the Lord. Keep on a reading. That ye henceforth walk not as walk other Gentiles. Not as other Gentiles walk. walk. In the vanity of their mind. In the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding having darkened. Having the understanding darkened. Being alienated, being from, alienated from the, life, from of the God, life of God. Through the ignorance, through the ignorance that, is in, that them, is in them. Read on. Because of the blindness of, the of, blind their, heart, of their heart. Who being past, who feeling, being past feeling. Having given, given themselves, themselves over unto lasciviousness. Unto lasciviousness to work all to work uncleanness, all uncleanness and greediness. He said walk not as other Gentiles walk. In the vanity of their mind. Hey, do you hear me? He had to work on his conscience. He had to not walk the way the world was walking. He had to walk different than the way the world was walking. He couldn't walk down the same road that the world was walking down. You can't walk the way everybody else is walking. If you're going to have your heart clean and pure, you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You need to put on the new man. You need to put off concerning the former conversation. That's right. This man exercised himself. Put off concerning the former conversation. Just go on to the next scripture. I don't have all night. Philippians 3, 13. Read it for me. Listen to me. It's work. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I but do. this one thing I do. Forgetting those things. Forgetting those things. Which are behind. Which are behind. I reach for I forgot them. I reach forget forth. about them. I reach forget forth. about them. Forget about them. Let me read. Forget about them.
up those things that are behind. And reaching for Well, I had to give up this, and I had to give up that, and I had to give up this, and I had to give up that. Paul said, forget about him. Forget about him. Yeah. Forget about him. Forget about him. Amen. Forgetting those things that are behind. Read on. And reaching forth to those I'm things. I'm reaching for the things that are before. before me. I pray. I'm a reaching for the calling that's yeah. in Christ Jesus. Yeah. I'm waiting for that prize. Yeah. I've got something to work for. I press toward the mark I'm of the prize. I'm pressing. I'm a pressing. Toward it the ain't prize. easy to press weights. It's work. It's exercise. But I've got a conscience that's born of the fence. Woo, come on now. Hallelujah. Go on to Romans 13. This man was qualified to write down to us. He exercised himself to have always a conscience. Read for me. And that knowing the time. And that knowing the time. That now it is high, it's time, high time, time to awake out of sleep. To awake out of sleep. For now is our For salvation now nearer. Is our salvation near? Than when we believe. When we believe. The night is far spent. The night's far spent. The day is at the hand. The day's at hand. Let us therefore cast off the Let works of darkness. Let us cast off. Let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor and of light. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us Hey, walk. friend, you got Paul's giving you how to the instructions. Paul's telling you how you can have a clean conscience. Yeah. Paul's telling you how to shout and worship God the way God wants you to do it. Yeah. Praise God. And make not. Let us walk honestly in the day. Honestly in the day. Be not in rioting. Not in rioting. Drunkenness. Drunkenness. Not in chambering. Chambering. Wantonness. Wantonness. Not in strife. Strife. Envy. Envy. But put on. Put on. The Lord. The Lord Jesus, Jesus, Christ, Jesus Christ. And make not and provision. Make not provision. For the flesh. For the flesh. To fulfill the to lust. To fulfill the thereof. lust. Thereof. Thereof. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This is the man that said in Acts 23 and 1, he said, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. This is the man that said in Romans 9 and 1, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. This is the man in 2 Corinthians 1 and 12 that said, Our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom. The reason why some people can't rejoice is because their conscience don't have a testimony. But Paul said, My testimony... Amen. And my rejoicing is the testimony of my conscience. You ain't got to make me shout, preacher. I come to church with my shout shoes on. I got a conscience void of offense. You ain't got to pump me up. You ain't got to cheerlead me like a bunch of Dallas cowgirl cheerleaders. I'm ready to get with the preacher. I'm ready to shout hallelujah. Preach it. You own it. Walk on it. Preach it. Preach. I'm ready to get with the program. I ain't going to shave my head. I ain't going to walk out on the preacher. Why? Because I've got a testimony in my conscience. i got some rejoicing. Amen. Why can you say amen? Yeah. What puts an amen in saints of God instead of an oh me? They're living what the preacher's living. They're doing what God's telling them to do. And their conscience Ooh. is testifying. Yeah. Praise God. This is the man that said in 1 Timothy 1 and 5, Now the end of the commandment is this. Charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and a faith unfeigned from which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling. And I'm going to tell you, when you lose the testimony of your conscience, you've lost the impact of your ministry. Oh, God. Now the end of the commandment is this. Charity out of a good heart. Praise God. And a, con- and a good conscience. It didn't say just love. Preach, brother. 
It didn't say, preacher, just preach love. More to it. it said, charity out of a pure heart. Out of a pure heart. And a good conscience. You can preach love all you want to and be sleeping with whores. You can preach love all you want to and be queer as a $3 bill. You can have the biggest network on television and preach until millions are coming through your door and you're still just preaching love, but you're not preaching it out of a pure heart and a good conscience. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. And preacher, if you ain't got a good conscience, it don't matter what you preach, you're just swerving in vain jangling. You're just wasting your time. You're just talking a bunch of hogwash. Because you can preach your little lovey-dovey message and you can call holiness holiness, but you can't call it quick cutting your hair, quit wearing your britches, lady. You just got to preach a bunch of vain jangling. Yeah. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. I'm going to go ahead and preach in hell. When you lose the testimony of your conscience, you've lost your ministry. You've lost the impact of your ministry. My God, have mercy. I'm going to tell you, I can't go to bed at night. If I don't preach what God tells me to preach, I can't sleep. My conscience won't let me sleep. I've got to preach it. I've got to do what God tells me to do. Hey, saint of God, you better live when you're a preacher preaching. I'm telling you what the Bible said. The end of the commandment is this. Yes, sir. Charity out of a pure heart, pure heart and a good conscience. It didn't just say the end of the commandment is charity. Uh-huh. Well, bread. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We must love these charismatic. Let's not offend him. They're our half brothers. I'm going to tell you, your conscience is right. How in the world can you compromise the good word of God just so you can cause some old flimsy, flamsy, lovey-dovey, charismatic, wishy-washy, believe anything that comes down the line. Hey, quit trying to make them feel good. Preach the Word of God and keep your conscience right before God because the day that you try to change this book to match their lifestyle, everything in your heart has become vain jangling and your ministry is getting trashed out. Your ministry don't mean nothing anymore and everybody knows it because they can't feel any anointing anymore. Go on, preach that junk. Go on, build you a big fancy church and have a big production and have a bunch of homosexuality and a bunch of adultery on your, in your choir and have them on you and have your beards and your long hair on the rostrum and your gold and your diamonds all through the church. Oh, you're doing right, ain't you? Hey, friend, you've sold out your ministry. You've sold it out. Your conscience is defiled. The Word of God means too much. Call that success. Second Corinthians 10 and 11, while we're on that. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Would you read that for me? I'm going to tell you something. Now, I'm not no macho pastor. I don't know how to do it. I, all I've ever done is evangelize for a few years. But I'm going to tell you, I can tell the difference between a church that's got a deep move of the Spirit and a church that's all shallow. I know that much about anything. I'll tell you, I know that much about something. I may not know how to be the great pastor. I may not be master pastor. But I know what God is. And I know what a good feeling and obeying your conscience is. And I know when a man's preaching and when a man's goofing around. I know that much. I know if he's preaching the Word of God or tiptoeing through the tulips. I know if he's preaching to get people to heaven or preaching to get money in his back pocket. 
Yeah, yeah. Woo! Go ahead. Let such an one think this. Let such a one think this. That such as we are in in word that by letters. That such as we are in word. What? By letters. By letters. When we are absent. When we're absent. Such will we be also indeed such will when we, we are be present. Such will we be also indeed when we're present. We ain't going to preach one thing over here and when we get there preach something else. You just remember that, Paul said. For we dare not make For ourselves. For we dare not. Make ourselves. Make ourselves. Of the number. Of the number. And compare ourselves. And compare ourselves. With some. With some. That commend themselves. That what? That commend themselves. That what? That commend themselves. Didn't say God commended them. Didn't say God commended them. Commend themselves. Said, uh, look what we've done. We've supported all these missionaries. We built this big edifice. We've done this. This is our big choir. We, hey, oh, you bunch of ignoramus little churches out there. If you had God, you'd be as big as we are. Look at this orchestra we've got. Look at this great big meeting that we've got. We're doing something for God, and all you peon little churches ought to get your act together and do something for God. Read it again. For we dare not make ourselves. We dare not make ourselves. Of the number. You better watch out when you try to fit in the crowd. Or compare. We're not trying. Paul said, I'm not trying to make myself of the number. I'm not, hey, I don't care. I, I don't care if that dude walks into to a church or to a camp meeting or some big meet, and there's you got ten little peons behind him all trying to be just like him. Yeah, we're with him. We're cool. I've watched him at camp meetings all over the country. I watched some conquerors president walk in, and there goes the, the nine little dwarves right behind him. All the way up to the rostrum. Boy, they're big shots. We're hanging around this guy. We got our act together. Man, we're sitting up here on the rostrum by the big honcho himself. You're on your way out. Hey, son, I don't care. <laughs> you hear me? I don't preach this way just here. I preach this way everywhere I go. I got a lot of friends. Tell it, brother. Amen. Some are in the UPC, some are in the ACI, and some ain't nothing. Yeah. But they all my friends. Paul wasn't in the UPC. And he wasn't in the ACI. Yeah. I'm with all you independents. Woo, go ahead. Go ahead. What's that got to do with it? Preach, brother. And I'm going to tell you, I'm preaching in the book tonight. You're in the book. I'm in the book tonight. And if, that don't, if you don't like that, then you don't like the book. Paul said, we're not making ourselves of the number. Who cares what the number's doing? Who cares what everybody else is doing? Let's live by the book. Listen to what Paul said. Everybody, hold on, sit down. Listen to what Paul said. We dare not make ourselves of the number. Or compare ourselves. Or compare ourselves. With some. With some. That commend that themselves. Commend themselves. Oh, I've got a vision. We're going to reach the world. My church is doing it all. Man, you let me loose in your church 40 minutes and I'll tell you what kind of church you got. I'll guarantee you, I'll tell you what kind of church you got. Just let me preach the Bible in your big old fancy church. And I'll find out who your board members are in a hurry. I'll find out who the tithe pairs are. Them big fat pocketbooks. I'll find out where they sit. They'll be the ones that turn red in the face and say, Bless God, you get this evangelist out of here right now. Because that little wimpy nosed preacher ain't got no guts to preach the word of God. No, he's going to flirt around. He's going to flirt around and act like some cool hand loop, some super spiritual guy, and don't even know how to live right and do right and put on the roster of people that need to be on the roster. But they, 
But they, but they measuring themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves, by themselves, and compare and themselves comparing themselves among themselves, among themselves are not wise. How many you run? Twelve hundred, ten thousand with our extension. Because we had some lady go into the hospital and say a prayer. How many of you run? How much did you give to this? 10,000. How much did you give? 95,000. Boy, you're going to preach conference next year for sure. Oh, you're going to be some big shot for sure. Mm. Notice who they're comparing themselves among themselves. Man, this preaching against watching filthy video movies, that's for the birds. We have enough spirituality to control that. Tell it, brother. Tell it. Hey, you know what? I stood on a conference floor one time at a UPC uh, at our general conference. Dear God, what am I saying on this? Help yourself. But I'm going to tell you, we had the big issue. Oh, Therese, you remember when we had the big video issue? And I've been preaching revivals all over the country, and I know what carnal churches are and what spiritual. And it's all an advantage can do to have a revival, let alone have one with everybody watching filthy video movies, trying to get people spiritual. And it was bad for that conference, but boy, they passed that thing. We're going to have our videos. So we can reach our poor widow shut in. Think of all them poor quadriplegics that can't get to church. And those shut-ins that could see services. And I sat there and my pastor got up. The one I prayed through under and he said, Now, boy, this video ain't wrong. And we need to quit squabbling over this. And we need to just pass it. And I thought to myself, Man, I personally have watched bunches and bunches of couples leave the church, divorce, remarry, come back, sit on the pew. They go on vacation, ladies wear britches, ride horses with blue jeans on. Beards playing the organ. Hair way down over the ears in the choir. Little necklaces singing, singing specials. And I thought, yeah. That's what television's done for your church, Big Daddy. Ch church full of TV, full of it. Hadn't even begun to live for God. You think I was going to sit there and mind my own business? No, I, I didn't come prepared. I didn't have no notes stand up in the general conference. I just heard this. My name is Gary Perdue. I'm a peon from nowhere. I just, I've been evangelizing. I know what, I know what this is going to do. And I'm just trying to have revival and see people get the Holy Ghost and live right. And I got a little boy and I want him to be saved. And, and I'm going to tell you, we opened the door to this. We ain't never going to have no revival. And it wasn't no time, friend. That thing passed. Oh, we control it. Walk into a room and there's the kids watching a movie. I felt so embarrassed for them. They're controlling movies. Filth. Comparing themselves among themselves. Yeah, yeah. What's the conscience got to say about all this? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You jump down to verse 8, it says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. Godliness will profit in every way. 
Titus 1 and 15, unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and their conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Now this scripture is showing us the importance of a good conscience. If our conscience isn't right, nothing in our lives is right. This issue is real easy to understand. When he said, Under the pure, all things are pure, and I'm going to close, right? It's real close. We're going to go eat, Brother Spell. Under the pure, all things are pure, but under them that are unbelieving and undefiled is nothing pure. Now, Paul knew what he was writing about. You know what he was writing about? He was writing about eating meat offered to idols. Hey, everybody, we're going to close here in just a minute. If you'll stay with me just a little while longer, I'll explain to you what's going on in the Scripture. I want to show you something. Let's direct our attention to this issue of eating meat offered to idols because we're going to find the answer about a whole lot of things in this. Because there's no Scripture in the Bible that says anything about eating meat offered to idols. But we're going to find out how the man of God handled this eating meat offered to idols. We're going to find out how he handled this, and there wasn't no scripture about it. And when we find out how he handled something that there wasn't no scripture about, how much more does he handle things that there is scripture against? You see, there was this weak brother whose conscience was weak. Someone said, well, that's just because he wasn't spiritual. No, that's because he hadn't been to church for just a few days. He was a weak brother. Just prayed through a few days ago. Just the other day, he was down there at that big old idol worshiping a Buddha belly, Buddha belly, Buddha belly. Eat meat. Oh, I eat this meat. Buddha belly, Buddha belly. Just a few days ago, he's down there worshiping that idol. Peter come by, preached a message. He prayed through, praising God, talking in tongues. He got rid of his. Idol. So he's out mowing his grass the next day and here's some brother in the Lord going by there and saying, hey man, hey, check it out, Doc. Free lunch. Here, mm. Try one of these. Got cheese on it. And here's this guy mowing his lawn. He sees him over there eating that meat outside the idol's temple. My God! He ate it! He went running. Oh, Paul! Paul! He ate meat over to an idol! He ate that meat! And there's an issue going on here. He ain't that me. That offends me. He ain't that me. I worshiped that thing just yesterday. And I walked in that living room there. They are eating it. Two days ago, I had one of them. I thought, I thought they got the Holy Ghost. I thought they were disciples of the Lord. That offends me. Oh, well. It can't help if you're weak and that bothers you. You've got to understand there's two things that come into play with this. Number one, first of all, there is a verse of Scripture that said, Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Isn't that right, Brother Majors? If you want to eat rattlesnake and possum, fat back, go right ahead. <laughs> Raw oysters, clams, anchovies, <laughs> armadillos. Every creature of God is, is good and nothing to be refused if offered with thanksgiving. I'm closing real quick. You'll just hang on. But there's also another scripture that comes into play here. For if I build again the things I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute here. Now we got an issue coming into play. We got a man that said, If I build again the things I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. And yet the Bible said there's no scripture against eating this meat because it's clearly defined very clearly in the book of Romans 14, verse 14. Romans 14, verse 14, read. I know and am persuaded I by know, the Lord Jesus. And I am persuaded by the Lord Jesus. There is nothing 
unclean of itself. There's nothing unclean of itself. But now, this him, is something that wasn't directed in Scripture. He's talking about how he's going to handle it. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean. To him it is unclean. To him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved. But, but, if thy brother be grieved. With thy meat. With thy meat. Now walketh thou. Now walkest thou. Not charitable. Now let's get this right. I just want to paint a picture to all you saints of God tonight. Now, here we got this guy. All he wants is just love, 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 love. Preach love, preacher. I just love everybody. Everybody's going to heaven. Love, love, love. Preach love, Brother Burgess. Love. That's all we need, saints of God. Love, love, love. I'm going to love you. You love me. We're going to love everybody. Everybody going to heaven. We're going to love everybody. But now here's this poor brother that sees you eating meat off or doing idol and it offends him and it's become a stumbling block to his conscience. Well, bless God, let him go to hell. I'm going to eat that meat. Now walkest thou not charitable. You mean you're going to jeopardize everything just so you can do what you want to do? You mean you're going to jeopardize everybody and everything just so you can have your way and eat your meatball? Now walkest thou not charitably. Now, what's really at stake here? I'm going to tell you what's really at stake. It's a soul that's at stake. Read. Destroy not him with Destroy thy meat. Destroy not him with thy meat. Wait a minute. Are you telling me me eating this meat has the ability to destroy this weak brother? You better believe it does. Yeah. Yeah, you got a right to eat that. But he said don't destroy him by eating your meat. Read. For whom Christ died. For whom Christ died. For me, destroy not For the work me, of God. destroy not the work of God. Oh, Just thanks. so you can please your flesh, don't destroy the entire work of God. Yeah, you can do it, but don't destroy the work of God to do it. All things are indeed Now this pure. is over something there was no scripture about. Everybody hear me? This is over something there was no scripture against. Nowhere in the Bible to say, you can't eat that meat. Read. All things are indeed All pure. All things are indeed what? Pure. Pure. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. But it is evil for that man that eateth with offense. It is neither to eat flesh, nor yes. to drink wine. Yes. Or anything whereby thy brother stumbleth. Right. Or is offended. Right. Or is made weak. Right. Hast thou faith? Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Yes. Happy is he that condemneth not himself. Yes. In that thing which he alloweth. Yes. And he that doubteth is damned he if he eat. Doubteth is damned if he eat. What we're getting here is this. Paul is showing you how important it is for you to keep your conscience right with God. All right. Paul is telling you, you don't realize how dangerous it is for you to do something when your conscience says, don't do it, don't or do it. I'm not sure, or I don't really know. It's one of those questionable things. I'm just not sure if it's right or if it's wrong. Hey, Paul said, leave it alone. Don't even take a chance. Obey your conscience. Make sure your conscience is right. Listen to this. Because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Everybody say it's sin. Praise God. Hallelujah. Verse 20. Of the same chapter. I've already read that. Okay. Okay. Uh, what's the other? First, first Corinthians chapter 8. We're closing with First Corinthians chapter 8. All right. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. Same argument, everybody. Same identical argument. Read. We know that an idol is nothing in the world. This idol is a wood. It's a speaker. It's a thing. It ain't nothing. That ain't God. 
that there is none other God but one. There's only one God. His name's Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. For though there be that are called gods. Though there be that are called gods. Whether in heaven or in earth. Whether in heaven or in earth. As there be gods many and lords many. Right. Read verse 7. How be it how there, be it, there is, not is not in every man in that every knowledge. Man that knowledge. Now, s- we've got some people, this thing, they can't figure it out. They're not comfortable with it. Just yesterday, they was worshiping this thing. They're convinced it's wrong. We're going to be spiritual enough. We're not going to jeopardize the issue. Do you ever hear that much? I mean, all this love preaching, certainly you're going to love your brother enough to say, well, I'll tell you what, just to make sure we're, we're doing the right thing, we're just, going to, we're just going to do away with this. We're not going to do it. But instead it's, bless God, i got a right to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You ain't preaching too lovey-dovey to me. Sounds to me like you ain't caring about nothing but your flesh and your will and your desire and everything you want to do. Now listen to this. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto the idol. They eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience This is where weak, the danger comes in. And their, being, their conscience being their conscience weak, being is, weak defiled. is defiled. For meat commendeth us not to God. For neither w- if we eat are we better. Neither if we eat not are we worse. Now, to be honest with you folks, it don't make, make a bit of difference. Whether you do this or not, it's not going to make you any better. It's not going to make you any worse. It's not that important. But the important thing is, there is this this ability that doing this has of defiling the conscience. It's a danger. There is a uh, a potential danger in doing this. All right. But take heed lest by any means this liberty... Thus by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. This liberty becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. Read. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge sit at meat with an idol's temple, You're shall sure. not the conscience shall not the conscience of a him which is weak which is weak be emboldened be emboldened to eat thereof to things, eat thereof things which are offered to idols. Which, if they see you doing it, isn't and that going to be a stumbling block to them? Isn't that going to cause them to be confused about what you're supposed to be doing, what you are doing, what you're not doing? And through thy knowledge, and through thy knowledge, shall the weak brother perish? Shall the weak brother perish? Why would this this weak brother perish? Because this weak brother's conscience is saying, "You better not do it." All right. You better not do it. You just better not do it. And yet they see you doing it, and it's causing them to want to do it. Well, that's no big deal. Let them do it. But if they do it. They're going to defile the law of God written on their heart that's telling them not to do it. They're going to jeopardize their walk with God because their conscience has been defiled. All right. Your conscience is more than what you may think it is. All right. If your conscience says don't do it, you better not do it. Well, bless God, preacher, you say don't do it, but the church ten miles away says it don't matter. It don't matter what the church ten miles away says. It's what your conscience is saying. Come on. And you're going to defile the only thing that God gave you to discern your way through the storms of life. I might have lost you a long way ago. We ended it up anyway. Come on. But when ye sin, so against... But when ye sin, now, wait a minute, this ain't no issue of sin. I mean, look, after all, this don't mean that much. It ain't that big a deal. My goodness, Paul said it's a sin. Paul said all of a sudden, this issue isn't a matter of eating meat or not eating meat. It's an issue of defiling someone's conscience and being a stumbling block to someone's conscience. And just because some dude says he's made a decision in his mind, there's not one thing wrong with this. 
Hey, you better be careful when you say there's not one thing wrong with this. Because there may be some folks out there that just two weeks ago got deliverance from that thing and that spirit and that attitude. And here you come along saying there's nothing wrong. Do all you want to do. Have your TV. Have your filthy movies. Do what you want to do. Go to your show. Go to your this. Go to your that. Go to your nightclubs. Listen to rock and roll. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Got your hair. Wear your makeup. Wear your britches. Let's just preach Acts 238. My Lord have mercy. Are we trying to have revival? Are we just trying to put some people in a building? All right. Are we trying to have an old-fashioned move of God? Or are we willing to throw everything we've ever had away just so we can please our flesh? Jesus, the name above.